Welcome to the Ship Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of news impacting the precious metals markets. It's Friday, April 7th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. So this might be a little bit shorter show. I'm battling the after effects of a nasty case of food poisoning. Fun, huh? So my wife makes these delicious snacks. They're kind of oatmeal and banana based, but they have chocolate in them. Low calorie, something that I try to eat instead of like munching on M&Ms, which make me fat. And so uh, I went in the refrigerator night before last to uh, get some of these snacks. And she's like, uh, honey, you know, those have been in there for a while. You might not want to eat those. And I'm like, no, they're fine. They're not too old. Besides, what's going to go bad is just banana and oatmeal and chocolate. Well, I was wrong. They were bad. My wife was right. Moral of the story, listen to your wife. So last night, uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I'm still feeling the after effects. Um, Not pleasant. But, you know, here's the thing. When you put poison in your system... Bad things are going to happen, no matter what you think or how strong you imagine yourself to be. Because in the back of my mind, it's like, yeah, these have been in the fridge for a while. But, you know, even if they're bad, I got a strong stomach. I'll be fine. I I was not fine. This is exactly the problem the Federal Reserve has. Earlier this week, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester said uh, she is sticking with expectations of rates topping 5% to curb inflation. So, in other words, inflation fight is still full steam ahead. Now, these people are going to keep saying this until something else breaks in the economy. And something else will break because the system is poisoned. It's poisoned with the drug of easy money. You know, I've said this over and over again. The entire economy is built on artificially low interest rates, money creation, and debt. It cannot function in a high interest rate environment. But unlike me and my bad snacks, the economy has actually become addicted to its poison. It now has to have it. It can't live without it. And when you take it away, well, then it gets sick, just like a drug addict gets sick when you take away his drug. You know, the drug is poison, but if you take it away, they go through withdrawal, and it's a horrible experience, it makes them very ill. The Fed has done just that, and the results are as unavoidable as my food poisoning was when I made the decision to eat the snacks. Now, the bank fiasco was the canary in the coal mine. By the way, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase said in a note to stockholders that the banking crisis isn't over. Now, when mainstream bankers say things like that out loud, you know there's a big problem, right? He wrote, As I write this letter, the current crisis is not yet over, and even when it is behind us, there will be repercussions from it for years to come. I'll link to an article on the show notes page that goes into more detail. Uh, The uh, J.P. Morgan CEO had some other interesting things to say about the economy that were rather poignant, so you can check that out over on the show notes if you're interested. Now, that letter actually drove another big sell-off in bank stocks, and it did give gold another boost. In fact, gold broke through the $2,000 level on Tuesday, and it pushed all the way to 2031 an ounce. That's getting close to the all-time record high, which is around uh, 2070. I think it's like 2071. Now, there was some selling and consolidation yesterday, but gold did manage to hold above 2000 at close, which I think is a significant level, and it's been above that now for two days. I think there is more resistance at around 2060, but if gold can broach that, I think it's off to the moon, and that's what some of the folks who do technical analysis tell me. By the way, speaking of gold, it was up 9% in the first quarter of this year. So if you bought gold late last year, you enjoyed a nice return over the last three months. Also in gold news, in February, central bank 
Gold reserves rose by another 52 tons. It was the 11th straight month of central bank net gold purchases. So through the first two months of 2023, net central bank gold purchases are at 125 tons. And this is the strongest start to a year since 2010. 2010 is significant because that was the first year we started to see net buying after many, many years of net central bank selling. China was the biggest buyer in February. The People's Bank of China in increased gold holdings by a reported 24.9 tons. It was the fourth consecutive month of reported Chinese gold purchases. In that time, China's official gold reserves have grown by 102 tons. Other big buyers last month, or in February, were India, Singapore, and Uzbekistan, and of course Turkey. Uh, Turkey's been buying gold consistently for well over a year. World Gold Council Head of Research Juan Carlos Artigas recently told Kitco News that these big purchases underscore the fact that gold remains an important asset in the global monetary system. Even though gold is not uh, part of the reserve system, we're not on a gold standard, it is still an important asset. Why? He said, even though gold is not backing currencies anymore, it is still being utilized. Why? Because it is a real asset. Unlike dollars. Speaking of dollars, there are more and more signs that its days as the global reserve currency may be numbered. And that's really bad news for the value of the dollar. Because if the dollar loses its status as the reserve currency, or even if that status is significantly undermined, its value is going to fall through the floor. We're talking about a serious dollar crisis. And that's when we're really going to see the impacts of all of this crazy money creation. You know, the whole reason that the Fed can create trillions of dollars out of thin air is because there is a huge demand for dollars around the world. Under the current global monetary regime, the greenback is king. People need dollars in order to transact business. People all over the world. Under the current system, most of the world's trade actually involves dollars through the Society of Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, which is SWIFT. For short, you've probably heard of it. It's the Basically, the, uh, the system that allows business to transact, it's kind of the, uh, the, the highway upon which financial transactions happen. This system enables financial institutions to send and receive information about financial tra transactions in a secured, standardized environment. And that standardization is the dollar. And since the dollar is the world's reserve currency, SWIFT actually facilitates the international dollar system. On top of that, you have the petrodollar, which is the fact that most oil transactions, the sale of oil, are also done in dollars. So this demand for dollars allows the U.S. government to get away with printing a bunch of them. If the dollar wasn't the reserve currency, it would already basically be like a Zimbabwe dollar. By that, I mean worthless. Now, a lot of people say the uh, say that Peter Schiff is wrong when he talks about a dollar crash because they are confident that the global demand for dollars will keep the whole system propped up, right? You might have heard of the dollar milkshake theory. That's basically what they're saying. There's such a demand for dollars that even if the Fed prints a bunch of them, it gets absorbed and shaken up into the system just like a milkshake. So everything's going to be fine according to this theory. The problem is a lot of countries are trying to minimize dollar exposure. So there were two bits of news on that front over the last couple of weeks. Uh, last week, China and Brazil announced a trade deal in their own currencies, completely bypassing the dollar. So that's another small shift away from dollar dominance, right? Under this new deal, Brazil and China will carry out trade directly exchanging yuan for reais, reais? I don't know how to say that, Brazil currency, um, the Brazil currency, and vice versa, instead of first converting them into dollars, which I can say. In a statement, the Brazilian Trade and Investment Promotion Agency said the agreement would, quote, reduce costs and, quote, promote even greater bilateral trade and facilitate investment. Now, Brazil ranks as the largest Latin American economy, and China is now its biggest trade partner. It used to be the U.S., but now it's China. So trade between Brazil and China comes to about $150 billion per year. Now, China also has dollarless trade agreements with Russia, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. 
The other news item that bodes ill for the dollar is that a Russian official recently announced that the BRICS nations are working to develop a new currency. And again, another sign that dollar dominance is waning. So we're seeing this movement toward de-dollarization, right? A de-emphasis of the dollar. These countries trying to get away from having to use dollars to, to no longer be dependent on the dollar. So the deputy chairman of the State Duma, which is the Russian parliament, his name is Alexander Babakov, he said the transition to settlements in national currencies is the first step. And in fact, we've already seen this occur with recent oil deals between India and Russia being settled in currencies other than dollars. And this has happened um, in some other markets as well. The next one, Babakov said, is to provide the circulation of a digital or any other form of a fundamentally new currency in the nearest future. He said, I think that at the BRICS Leaders Summit, the readiness to realize this project will be announced. Such works are underway. So that summit is actually scheduled for this August, not far away. Babakov said that the BRICS nations are developing a strategy that quote, does not defend the dollar or euro, and that a single currency would likely emerge within BRICS pegged to gold or other groups of products uh, such as rare earth elements or other metals. Now, you'll notice that a lot of countries that are trying to minimize dollar exposure are putting a lot of emphasis on gold. You remember I said that the biggest central bank buyer in February was China. Think about the other central banks. Uh, almost all of them fall into that camp. Uh, we've got you know countries like India and Singapore. They're trying to minimize that dollar exposure. They're buying gold. So anyway, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa currently make up the BRICS block. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but it actually accounts for about 40% of the global population and, at this point, a quarter of global GDP. Last year, Iran officially applied to join BRICS, and according to a report by a news outlet called The Cradle, several nations have expressed interest in joining the bloc, including Saudi Arabia, Algeria, uh, UAE, Egypt, Argentina, Mexico, and Nigeria. So this is a block of nations, trading partners. It's growing quickly, makes up a huge portion of the global population. And those economies are emerging economies. They're growing larger and larger, and they're going to, as time goes on, make up a bigger and bigger part of the GDP. So obviously, if you kind of do the math, if all of these countries don't need dollars anymore, well, that's eventually going to put pressure on the dollar's role as the reserve currency. Now, former Goldman Sachs chief economist Jim O'Neill, he actually coined the BRIC acronym. That was before South Africa joined. And in a recent paper published by the Global Policy Journal, he actually urged for the expansion of BRICS. He thinks it's important to have this competition for the dollar. He said, quote, the U.S. dollar plays a far too dominant role in global finance. Whenever the Federal Reserve Board has embarked on periods of monetary tightening or the opposite loosening, the consequences on the value of the dollar and the knock-on effects have been dramatic. In other words, if we can minimize our exposure to the dollar, we can minimize these these shocks that come through the system when the Federal Reserve does dumb things with its money. So the bottom line is that it's clear that many countries are trying to minimize their exposure to the dollar. Confidence in the dollar continues to erode thanks to profligate borrowing, spending, and money creation by the U.S. government. Believe me, during COVID, when the Federal Reserve printed some $4 trillion, the world was watching. They understand that the more dollars there are, the less valuable each individual dollar is, right? Um on top of that, we've got America's use of the dollar as the foreign policy weapon. You know, they use it for sanctions. And, and again, a lot of these countries don't want to be exposed to being able to be pressured by U.S. foreign policy. So uh, that's making these countries wary of relying on the dollar. And of course, there's been other news along these lines over the last year or so. Uh, Saudi Arabia has talked about being open to discussing trade in currencies other than U.S. dollars. And, you know, that could mark the beginning of the end of the petrodollar. Um, and then in March, Reuters reported that recent oil deals between India and Russia have been settled in currencies other than dollars. I think I mentioned that already. So 
there's just a lot of things going on. I mean, even back a couple of years ago, uh, during the uh, rush, the U.S. first really starting to try to pressure Iran over the nuclear deal, we actually saw some proposals in the eurozone to create an alternate payment system that didn't depend on dollars. So. You know, in a way, we're we're kind of digging our own grave here in the United States by the way we handle the privilege of being the reserve currency. Now, I grant you, we are still a long way from the dollar losing its status as the world reserve currency. I don't think it's going to collapse tomorrow. I'm, I'm not a collapsitarian. I think ultimately <clears throat> we're heading in that direction, though, right? Its dominance is clearly eroding. Get this. According to the International Monetary Fund, the dollar share of global foreign exchange reserve actually fell below 59% at the end of 2021. That extended a two-year decline in the amount of dollars held as reserves. Again, if those dollars aren't being held as reserves, then that means they're out there floating around in the economy. That is, in effect, inflation, more dollars chasing the same amount of products. So if you kind of think about this, it's like a death by a million paper cuts, right? A a friend of mine posted what I think is a really good analogy, and uh, apparently it was used by Miles Franklin CEO Andy Sheckman. Uh, He was talking about the economy as a whole, but I think this analogy holds just as well for the dollar. So basically think of the economy or the dollar as a Jenga tower. There are lots of small blocks that create stability for a large interdependent structure. Now, occasionally a block gets removed, right? Each of these moves to de-dollarize are one block. So when, you know, BRICS starts talking about an alternative currency, that's a BRIC coming out. When uh, you have Saudi Arabia talking about doing oil deals in, in currencies other than dollars, that's a BRIC. So what we're seeing now is an increase in the pace of these blocks being removed in the U.S. dollar Jenga tower. So one block taken out, again, doesn't create a huge problem, nor does two or even three. But each block that is taken out creates a bit more instability. And if you've ever played Jenga, you know what happens eventually. Crash, right? Now, as I already said, the only reason the U.S. can get away with its massive budget deficits, its huge government spending programs, the ever-growing national debt, the only way it can get away with this to the extent that it does is because of the dollar's role as the world reserve currency. It creates a built-in global demand for dollars and U.S. treasuries that absorb the money creation and, and maintain dollar strength. But what happens if that demand for dollars drops? Or, God forbid, goes away completely. What happens if China and other countries simply decide they don't want to hold a currency that's losing value every day? If the demand for dollars tanks, the greenback's value is going to quickly erode away. That means even worse price inflation for Americans. It's another problem for the Fed that they haven't even... Well, I mean, maybe they've talked about it behind closed doors, but they certainly haven't said anything about it publicly. I mean, this is inherently inflationary. De-dollarization globally is going to be inflationary here at home because all those dollars is just going to end up back here uh, driving up our prices. And of course, in the worst case scenario, it could collapse the dollar completely. And we could see a complete dollar collapse, a huge financial crisis. So we need to be ready for this eventuality, right? I mean... Boy Scout motto, be prepared. Um, Every reserve currency has eventually fallen from the top of the mountain. Every empire has eventually fallen. And, you know, again, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow, but I would not be surprised if we don't see it happen in my lifetime, certainly my kid's lifetime. So I want to have some hedge against dollars, just like China, just like India, just like a lot of these other countries want to have a hedge against dollars. I want to have a hedge against dollars. A great hedge is, of course, gold, silver, precious metals. As we've seen, a lot of these central banks are accumulating gold because it is a hard asset. There's no counterparty risk, and its value is never going to go to zero. The dollar's value could theoretically go to zero, right? So I think you still have time to buy gold before we really start to see the run-up. Now, again, we're over $2,000 an ounce. It appears that we're holding that 
support level for now. I mean, you know, we could get the jobs report later today, or it's probably already out if, by the time a lot of you are listening to this. But, um, you know, there could be things that'll drive it back down again, but it's clearly on the up upswing, right? And I think once it holds 2000 for a significant amount of time and then breaks through that 2060, 2060, I think it's to the moon. But there's still time is what I'm saying to buy some gold. Talk to a shift gold precious metal specialist today. Call 1-888-GOLD-160. Or you can simply email info at shiftgold.com. Or you can go to the shift gold page, shiftgold.com. Go to the getting started tab. And right there, you can chat with a precious metal specialist right there online. These guys are fantastic. Again, they're going to look at your investment goals, your budget, what you're trying to do uh, with your finances and help you see how precious metals might fit into your strategy. So with that, I've about blown up what energy I had today. Again, listen to your wife if she tells you not to eat the bad snacks. We're going to call this a gold wrap for this week. You can get more details on all of these stories and more and keep up with the latest precious metals news and analysis throughout the week over at shipgold.com slash news. Of course, you can subscribe to the Friday Gold Wrap podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Google Podcasts. We're on Stitcher. We're on the Ship Gold YouTube channel. We're everywhere. Links on the show notes page. Go ahead and subscribe, and you don't have to look for us. You can email me, mmaharry, M-M-A-H-A-R-R-E-Y, at shipgold.com. Love to hear from folks. I hope you guys have a uh, wonderful weekend and a happy Easter.